Good morning, LaSalle. Thank you for being part of our worship service this morning. We have come to the end of this seven week series on powers and principalities. Each week we've taken our lead from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Chapter six, verse 12, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but powers and principalities against rulers in the high places. So for a moment this morning, let's take stock of some of the things we've covered in these past few weeks. Relax, we're just gonna deal with a couple of high points, okay? First, we've learned that institutions and organizations and structures, the mechanics of the world, those things are not neutral. They take on the energy and the motivation, the charism of the ones who created them and run them. They embody particular enthusiasms, particular powers in the world. And as Lucas reminded us last week, we are complicit in these systems of power. We're accomplices, whether we've chosen to be or not. Secondly, we've considered the tools that God has given us to not only resist these powers of evil, the powers of the institutions, but also to proactively wield the power of good. And repeatedly, we have kept returning to the example Jesus sets before us. The way Jesus turned from the familiar flavors of power, as Pastor Randall preached, and turned to serve, to lift up the other. Jesus who knelt rather than bloated. Jesus who gave rather than took. Jesus who kept releasing rather than grasping. Each week, we've seen how Jesus reorders our relationship with hierarchy and dominance and domination. And he does this by repeatedly calling us out. We are called out to be resistors of the world's norms. We're called out to be prophets of a new future. We're called out to be citizens of a different kind of kingdom. We're called out from the stratification, the separation of the powers and principalities, and we're called out from the dominion of sin. But more than being called out, we're also being called in, and this is what I really want to hammer today. We're called into a world where justice and tenderness and kindness and gentleness become the norm. We're called into a community of inclusion, of usness, so radical that it's almost uncomfortable. We're called into a way of life that seeks the best, not just for our friends, but for our enemies, <laughs> that guards each one's dignity and saves each one's pride. We're called into a life that shows we are Christians by our love. We've already heard a few examples of people being called out to be called into something, someone larger. Dave Metz earlier describing those weekly gatherings in Durango, Colorado, as people literally leave their home, called out, go out every Friday night to show up and speak up, to be part of included in a greater moment of justice for black lives. We've heard from Yvonne Hudson, choosing to be called into pain that she would just as soon forget. Now she realizes that that pain must be seen and let in, taken in, integrated into her life. Well, this is the essence of the Christian story, isn't it? That from the beginning, we are created for life that's more expansive than just little me and you. We're created for worlds and ways of being in those worlds that are bigger than us. Every call out is followed by a call in. And this is what we're going to see today in our text. I love this text out of Act. It's the, the great story of Saul's conversion into becoming Paul. When the story opens, Saul is uttering threats with every breath, was eager to kill. A man who relished killing. Well, you can say that again. And actually, the text does say that again. They tell us several times just how venomous Saul was. If you flip back just two chapters to chapter 7, the writer, that's Luke, he's filing a kind of eyewitness reporting story at the murder of Stephen. Acts 7, verses 57 through 59, the crowd rushes at Stephen, drags him out, begins to stone him, 
and the crowd lays their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul approved their killing. The early church had enemies, angry enemies who attacked and dragged them out and held them down. Enemies who spat in their faces, who hunted them in the night. Is your mind going through maybe its own slideshow right now? Think of those images. Saul was one of them. He was a pedigreed guy, completely convinced that his cause was righteous. He was keeping Judaism pure. He was protecting his faith from this band of religious heretics, people of the way, as the early church was called. If you were to move Saul to the 21st century, it wouldn't be too much to imagine Saul at some of those things you just saw. Saul wearing a make Judaism pure again hat. That is until Saul was called out. It happens as he's on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus. That's a span of about 135 miles. And he sees this flash of unbearable light and he falls to the ground and he hears this voice asking, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? To which Saul responds, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, not really. That's not exactly what he said, but essentially it's the same thing. He says, who are you, Lord? Saul knows the Old Testament all too well. He knows the stories of what it's like when Yahweh addresses someone. He knows the double name, Jacob, Jacob, of Genesis 46, Samuel, Samuel, of 1 Corinthians 4, the blinding glory of Moses and Isaiah, what they experienced. Saul knows this is God calling. What he doesn't get is how he could possibly be persecuting him. Good grief, don't you know? I'm one of the good guys, Lord. I'm the one keeping hope alive among the Jewish people down here. We know it's confusing for him because that's when the voice gets really specific. I am Jesus. It's me you're persecuting. Major call out here. <laughs> You're not only not on the side of God, you're actually persecuting the Son of God. Man, applications are endless here. If we were just to stop right here, not only are the oppressed beloved in God's sight precious to God's name, but so are apparently the oppressors, the ones who do the murdering, the ones who do the politicking, the ones who do the cross burning. What? We've talked about this often throughout this series, but my enemies are many, and maybe yours are too, and I don't think we can be reminded too many times. We are consistently called out, called out, called out from cycles of retribution and destruction. But beyond that, look at this. Saul is called in, into the presence of a man named Ananias. Ananias, the very enemy Saul had gone looking to kill. God was going to use Saul's enemy as the one who would make him Saul to Paul. <laughs> and Ananias too also gets a call, right? Go out of your house and go into the embrace of this enemy named Saul. And why? Because the relationship Ananias was going to have with Paul was going to be so instructive that it was going to bring the deeper direction of Paul's life and ministry into focus. The other's enemy was going to be the vehicle, the means by which both of them were going to flourish. How countercultural is that? As Walter Wink writes, that our enemy becomes the goad that brings us to God. The call out is just part of the equation. We're called into the lives and the suffering and the struggles and the joys of others. Jesus went into the house of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Jesus, in one of the most famous verses of the scripture, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I'll come in. I'll dine with them. 
And then the very next story in Acts, the Apostle Peter will receive a vision of a sheet being lowered from heaven with all these animals. He's going to hear a voice saying, Peter, Peter, I've made them all clean. And immediately Peter will be called into the home of another enemy, the Gentile Cornelius. Being called in, Peter, Paul, they aren't called in to pontificate or impress. And I use that word carefully because how many times do you and I come into groups? We go in, but we go in to show them just how much work we've done, what our cred is. No, these guys are called into the reality of others to live with them, to be changed by them, to share life together. And in so doing, they are drawn further and further from the shores of comfortability, from the one place they are standing, and they are brought into this larger community. That's part of what's happening in our world right now. The Black Lives Matter movement is drawing people, white people, black people, into this larger world of experience. And some of us are interrogating our lives, like Yvonne and Dave. That's what Caitlin Rogers Perez was doing with the Me and White Supremacy class, calling this group out from our unconscious habits and our lifestyles so we can hear the call to the bigger human family. And that reminds me of what Marta Alicia told me last week. When Marta first came to Chicago from Mexico many years ago, she began worshiping in a black church not far from her home in Pilsen. She felt called out from her Spanish-speaking community and her Catholic roots because she wanted to know these people. Marta had been taught to fear black people, but she knew that fear wasn't of the Lord, and these people are her neighbors. <laughs> she knew she was called into their lives, into friendship, into connectedness, and worship was the way in. But Marta didn't stop there. She took out all the library books she could read so she could learn the history, the cultures, the heroes, the heroines of her neighbors. Because being called in was about relationship. Man, is this what Jesus means? When he calls his disciples into all the world? <laughs> In our power trip, we saw it exclusively as top-down prophetic work. But Jesus calls from the inside out, from the bottom up. Could it be that that's what he's been asking of us all along? Jesus came in the world and he experienced the wind on his cheeks and the joy of food at table with friends and conversation with strangers in the middle of the day and sharing of grief in the garden. He so loved us that he wanted to experience what we experience. And I believe he calls us to experience life with even our sworn enemies. Ananias, Cornelius, they're called into some pretty scary situations. I don't want to forget them. Leaders of a persecuted movement. In the case of Ananias in our text, he was called to embrace a man who had actually murdered people he likely knew. The theologian Walter Wink says that the acid test of a Jesus follower is whether you're prepared to love your enemies. And man, Ananias takes the oppressor directly into his home, into his life. And that takes a lot of courage. Meaning Ananias had to truly believe that God loved his enemy as much as God loved him. And he had to believe he could love his enemy because God loved his enemy. That was the brilliance of Martin Luther King and Howard Thurman. They understood that the emancipation of their enemy was tied to their own freedom as well. They drew that we broad enough to include the hated and the hater. I did an interview with my friend Doug Padgett earlier this week. You guys know Doug. He's been with us several times. And we talked about how we're all seeking a, a better way of being Christ followers in this world right now. Let's listen to his response. What's the thing we call people to? What, what are we for? 
Um, yeah, and, do it. Yeah. Listen, listen and, with this. And, and I think, <laughs> and I think, for and against are really good words. I think they're really good uh, prepositions. But I think out and in is a little better. So I don't know that the what you're for because that always feels like when you start to describe what you're for, like inclusion and generosity and kindness and mercy and love and joy and peace and patience and all that. Mm-hmm. All those things start to feel to people like they're like, well, what's the real thing? So I, sometimes I, I like to say, like, who are you now in with that you weren't in with before? The, the real measure of this, and this is very, you know, Walter Wink, like, who, who, is the, who are the ones that you're in or inside you, you're inside that used to be uh, you, that you were outside of or that were outside of you? And that, that power of in, I think, is the inclusive thing that we're going after. Um, so what should we be for inclusion into one another's lives that we haven't been in, that we haven't been involved with? Like you start playing with that in word and it, you start yeah. recognizing how it shows up in all those, all those ways in our, in our society. So I think the test for us is communities, for individuals, for uh, companies that are trying to reconcile, do, do racial reckoning. Well, who's in your boardroom? Who's, what places are you in? Where do you sell your product? If you run stores, where are your stores? In what neighborhood? Like the, the question of where are you and the in-ness is probably the great, the great ask of, the, of, of an awakening moment is, you know, when you now look around, whose house are you inside of, uh, whose house you weren't inside of before? Called out to be called in. Who are you in with? Who's in with you? The early church became a movement in part because they kept drawing that circle wider and wider and wider from circumcised Jew only to Greeks, from Hellenized citizens from around the Mediterranean, from Hebrew speakers to Roman leaders to Ethiopian eunuchs, even the dreaded Samaritans. The circle was big enough to hold them all. And tradition holds that Ananias continued to push boundaries. After his time with Saul, Ananias travels to modern-day Lebanon, where he will be imprisoned and killed for his faith, but not before he converts his jailer and seven other inmates who will all follow him in martyrdom. And as you know, Paul in our past, Saul in our passage will be renamed Paul, the apostle who will pen some of the broadest religious images ever given to the world. To Ephesians, the cross of Christ has broken all the walls of hostility between us. To the church of Rome, there's nothing that could ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. To the church of Galatia, there is no longer any Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul is going to go on to be the most radically inclusive person outside of Jesus himself. And he learns that in part by living inside the walls of his sworn enemy, Ananias. Brothers and sisters, God is doing something today. Oh, we don't want to miss it. We want to get on board with this work. This is a time for us to model a different way of life, a different way of living in this world, a way that's just as wildly distinct and as controversial today as it was when Jesus practiced it. It's a way that's called out from the familiar boundaries of segregation and separation and called into a community of hope and inclusion. So ask yourself today, who are my enemies God is calling me to love? Who are those outside people so unlike you, but equally loved by God? Ask yourself, where are you drawing your own line of inclusion wider and wider and wider? Where are you being called out so that you can be called in? Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, this world is yours. Our friends and our enemies, yours. 
all of it belong to you. And we ask that you would expand our hearts and fill our spirits with love for all. That we would start with our enemy. That our circle would grow wider and wider. Our embrace is wide as the embrace of Jesus himself. We ask all of this, Lord, in your name. And all God's people say, Amen.